Good to see you guys. Good to meet you, Ruben. Yeah. Good to see you again, mm -hmm. Michael. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's fun to be back. Uh, I mean, we're all, the three of us are all, you know, approaching classical architecture from cl slightly different angles, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I was educated as an architect, you're educated as an urbanist, and you're doing this amazing, uh, amazing work as an engaged citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've gotten into it that way. Um, I think to kick things off, there's, mm -hmm. uh, there's one question that I've been thinking about is, and also like which word to use, but I've been thinking about how do we invite people in? into classical architecture, into practicing this stuff. Um, I, th I think, uh, so, so if you want, you can tell like, a little mm -hmm. bit about how you personally became engaged in this stuff and how you got into it. And then uh, I can say a little bit about how I did it. But uh, I think it's so important also because I feel there's, there's a slight change of the mood out there. Uh, and it's so important for us right now, I think, to, to be able to, to invite people in and to have these, let's say, strategies for how to, uh, how to open up and how to, uh, how to uh, you know, grow uh, what's happening. Um, do you want to start with me, Michael? Just yeah. telling about your, yeah. your way into this. Yeah, uh, my, my way into this. Yeah. Uh, I think it, my way into it was like many others. I just found a channel to do something about it. Uh, when I was a teen, you know, we, we walked to, we, I lived in a suburb and me and my friends, we went into downtown to play laser, do, laser games mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and go to the cinema. And it always struck us, you know, how horrendously ugly 1960s buildings were and how beautiful the classical building was. Mm -hmm. We lacked total vocabulary. It's just like old buildings are beautiful and the 60s ones are just horrible. Mm. And that was just a fact. We didn't think so much about it, but we talked about it, you know, how ugly everything from the 1960s were. Mm. Then we could, I continued growing and we went to an island, an island in the Baltic Sea called, called Gotland. Mm. Uh, it's a very, very beautiful me medieval city there called Visby. Uh, and yeah, we, we were young, so we went there to party. Okay. <laughs> and like in one, you know, drunken conversation, uh, I had said something that my friends made laughs, you know, why don't they build any new old houses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, lack of terminology. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah they, thought, they thought it was hilarious. Mm. And, and from there, like it, it started, you know, why, why is everything so ugly? Mm. Why is everything so ugly? And, you know, everyone I talked to also thought that it was ugly. Mm. But it's just like matter of fact, you know, mm. you vote for your feet. Okay, I don't really like the ugliness, so I, I go to somewhere that is beautiful. Mm. And many years went, I went to university and, and studied society planning. Uh, oh, urban planning would be maybe the English word, but we don't have cities in Sweden. We have urban, uh, like, tätort, dense areas, you mm, say. Mm. Uh, so I studied it and I thought maybe this is the way I can change, but no, nah, that was not the way. Uh, social media came in 2007. I was interested in this subject and I did some Google research, but I, I didn't find so much and then life happened. But then in 2012, 2013, when Facebook had matured a little bit, and I said this in an other interview, is that Facebook began like with people posting photos of their food. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm sorry to say, and I'm going to get lots of criticism for this, but I think it's really idiotic to post photos of your food. And I did try that for fun once and I got like 50 likes for posting a photo of my, I bought like a sheep uh, from Lidl store, like a sheep <laughs> lunch set. And I like hashtag it like quality dinner, quality, uh, like, like everyone liked it. But that matured and that crowd moved to Instagram. Mm. So Facebook were a lot of interesting groups. So I thought I want to create like a group for this and I wanted to be practical because there are a lot of like showing old photos like uh, uh, <laughs> this is beautiful Italy or this is beautiful France. But yeah, uh, local history groups. Yeah, local and, history yeah. groups. Mm -hmm. But why don't try to find something new? Mm. And engagement need to be local. So I started in, in Swedish. And the whole intention was just to show a Swedish audience, you know, it, it's changing the mind. 
So by then you knew there were the new traditional architecture I knew projects there were. happening. Yeah, yeah, I knew whether I didn't. There was not like this infrastructure that there is today, but you could find some websites mm. with architects that showed their projects, mainly mm. American ones, mm. uh, and you can find good photos and still that they were new built in 2007 and 2004. And that, mm. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, okay, uh, so that's uh, what convinced you, is, was just seeing those examples and, yeah. and just the year it was yeah. built, basically. And then how to make a Swedish audience accept this, because my, my cultural analysis of, of Sweden and, and Swedes is that they have very good uh, technical self-esteem, but they have very low cultural self-esteem. Okay. So it needs to be approved by New York and Berlin for Swedes to accept it. Mm -hmm. So... I started by like, I must show photos of new traditional architecture from New York and Berlin. Mm -hmm. Because in the whole conversation, it's, oh, you're backwards and everything. But mm. no one will accuse Berlin or New York for being backwards. Mm. In Sweden. So it's mm. just absurd. Mm. Uh, so if these places build it, it must be the latest, the coolest, mm. <laughs> the thing that you should do. Okay. Uh, so that, that, yeah. that was my yeah, long road of starting this. And That's then, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, cause you, so you very early had these considerations of how to appeal to people and, and sort of, uh, yeah, um, I would almost say like empathy of, of, of yeah. uh, the minds of, of yeah. the people you wanted to reach. Yeah, my main interest is not architecture. Uh, now <laughs> okay. I, I came out here. So, um, <laughs> but it's social anthropology and history. Mm -hmm. So I love uh, ethnicities and, and, and we could have a show here about... Uh, peoples in central Congo and I would love it mm. uh, or uh, culture of Europe or Latin America or Asia or, or anywhere that's my main interest but there is no money in it mm. my first lecture in, in uh, ethnology uh, at the university the teacher said don't study this mm -hmm. you're just gonna get unemployed <laughs> it's like it, it, yeah, killed my soul you know oh. a little bit when I <laughs> heard it <laughs> so yeah so then it took me otherwise but that's my main interest and it connects very much with architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you feel a resistance within yourself towards like accepting making buildings that look old even though they're not? No. No. Not at all. You were just like, thumbs up? Yeah. No. I remember, because, no. I, because I remember the first time I encountered this phenomenon, I was like, at least you have to build it out of concrete or something. You can't mm -hmm. literally build a stone mm -hmm. building in classical architecture. Like mm -hmm. that's not... That's somehow not real, or or mm. it's like a stage set or something. But that might be, you know, the architect mind. Exactly, yeah. because I don't have an architect's mind. <laughs> <laughs> I I I had no problem with it. Yeah. Of course, you come into consideration. You don't, and I mentioned this in many. Issues, I don't want to stop time. Mm. So it's not that I don't want. I, what, what is it that we want in the new traditional movement? Mm. We don't want an eternal 19th century. Mm. We want the classical framework mm. and philosophy, how to design a building. Mm. And from that framework and philosophy, there is an unlimited amount of styles. Yes. So 99.99% mm. of classical styles has not been invented or emerged mm. yet. Mm. But in order for that, we need to get take some steps back and people mastering the craft again then a few geniuses not everyone mm. will break the rules in a good manner mm. like they did with Jugend and all the styles before and then we'll get a new classical style mm. so it's as simple I, as that i think mm. i think it's uh it's real fun to hear like mm. you hear talking about because i can i can hear the social anthropologists talking <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh yeah I, I guess coming from architecture school i'm just so used to people having made up their opinion on this mm. very very early on mm. i mean like at the age of 14 or something mm. they will have very very strong opinions on this and uh but you're approaching it with so much more curiosity and that's I guess that might be one to answer as to yeah. how because to invite people in. Because of culture. I'm sorry, Ruben, you were going to talk soon. <laughs> I, I just get started here, so I will quit of this one. But if you study you know, social anthropology and history and are interested in different cultures, you see all these amazing cultural synergies. Mm. So you mm. had, uh, I mentioned it in yesterday's interview, you have Chinese Art Deco, mm. you have Vietnamese Art Deco, you even have new built Chinese and, and, and Vietnamese Art Deco now. Mm. You know, you have Art Deco. You see it's a deco, but you know, the, the stylistic elements are from their respective traditions, you know, mm. the Vi Vietnamese vernacular and Chinese vernacular and their motifs in their, from their culture. Uh, you, have, you had in the 30s, you had Mayan revival art deco. That's art deco, but they used the Meso Mesoamerican uh, mm. 
how to say decoration patterns and gods and everything. Yeah. And how many how many fusions of this are not you know have not yet been done you know oh, interesting way. It's a beautiful thought. Yeah. So you have you have one that I, I really I, I wait to see is in northern Nigeria there is this very large uh, ethnic group called Hausa. Mm-hmm. They build a uh, very, very beautiful and interesting vernacular architecture and the patterns that they make, it's called, I think it's called the Northern Star or Northern Knot mm. that they decorate their buildings with, they would be perfect or deco mm. decorations. Cool. If, so how do you say, it's like a bridge, you know, because when they reach modernity they need, you know, hospitals and airports and everything, mm. but they combine syncretized, you know, let's say a modern building, but with their thoughts and their vernacular and their history and fuse it. Mm. So there can be a lot of fusions and syncretes happening in the world instead of everything reduced to glass, concrete, steel. Mm. Uh, star architect made a strange shape of this airport, so now yeah. it's unique or something. <laughs> so now I'll be silent. So, so, so. <laughs> no, yeah. Mm. What about you, Ruben? Um, yeah, how we got into this, uh, just going back to the first yeah. question. Yeah, just like the whole frame of mind and, and how you started, yeah. Yeah, well, of course, I... Identifying with it, I guess. Um, so, so I was also interested from a very early age in, uh, in architecture. And mm-hmm. I think it, for me, it grew a bit out of a fascination for tall buildings, for skyscrapers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but that evolved into more because as I know already in like 2008 or 9 or something, I was... Uh, yeah, not even, I think, 18 by that time. I already went to Brandevoort, which is a Dutch mm. town known for its traditional architecture. Yeah, I've seen um, the pictures. So. Um, not sure if it's the most successful example, but it's, it's, uh, it is um, because it's kind of like an enclave. But, mm. um, but it, is, it is a very interesting example in the Netherlands. And I went there to, to take pictures, to see mm. it for myself. And I already s- saw, like, I, I uh, for yeah, the previous interview, I was already, like, looking at my previous notes I made during when I was studying like a bit earlier and uh, I was already drawing like Corinthian columns and stuff just doodling it um, and that's interesting because um, yeah I, I wasn't really aware when I was interested in this like that direction of architecture mm. so but it was there quite early already that I was interested in that uh, thing otherwise I would have never gone to Brandevoort uh, already during high school so, um, but I think also for me, uh, I look at it, uh, I look also at architecture as, um, as an urbanist and as an urban planner. So, and you also get a lot of sociology during your uh, urban planning studies to know like how people uh, and societies function. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's also a very different uh, way of looking at buildings. Mm. Uh, like you look at buildings, how they function in a city and how they function with people instead of oh this is my concept this is this is what i what i want to build this is my artistic view of a building and i'm going to mm-hmm. place it in the city mm-hmm. uh, instead you see hey uh, yeah like you said people vote with their feet they go to certain places mm. which they like mm. why is that and then mm. you see these patterns and then you see hey that works and that urban fabric doesn't work mm. um and yeah so so um i was also kind of wondering by myself uh, but I never found a group of people uh, yeah who thought like hey can we build like this mm. uh, and to see Brandevoort was for me like a, a, a sign that it was but mm. I never took it as serious for a long time because I thought it is a kind of a, a small thing happening in the sidelines uh, it's not a major um, uh, thing and it will never grow big and there's it's limited for some reason. It's it's it doesn't stand a chance. Um, but then, yeah, you 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 realize there's way more people thinking about it and working mm. on it. Mm. Mm. Uh, and for me, that was a big that was the biggest thing for me that I uh, realized that there is actually that it actually forms an alternative and a viable alternative. Mm. Mm. So yeah, that's really cool. And then uh, you you. you I think you you've told me you haven't like designed a lot of buildings that have been built yet or no I'm, gone I'm not that far. I'm not a uh, practicing <coughs> urban designer. No, uh, but you might want to in the future. I might want to. Yeah. In the Netherlands, you do have to become enlisted uh, as like an architect in the architecture registry. So you okay. need to work for a couple of years to get that experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, I might. I I mean, but you can also give advice on the city. You yeah. don't need to draw, and then you don't need that license. Yeah. 
uh, so that might also be a path I want, want to take. Consultancy or, exactly. or something. Yeah, yeah. So um, do you think do you think that path that you described, I mean, we can't all go to Brandefort, uh, even mm -hmm. though that would be uh, lovely. Uh, <laughs> but um, for, for people who might not have access to those examples in their yeah. vicinity, but might be curious about these things or might just, you know, need to see this, this yes. stuff. Like, how do you think we could like invite them in? Or Yes. Well, so, yeah, that's what we talked before. It's there. I think there's a couple of steps in getting involved in this. Yeah. Um, and it all starts with just seeing it, like mm. finding it online, for example. That's why we have Michael. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's where, that's, that's what, uh, yeah, M Michael is uh, specialized in, of course, mm. and uh, bring it to a bigger audience and also what the Ar Architecture Uprising is doing. But just seeing the before and after pictures is yeah. for some people like a realization moment that they, hey, mm. wow. It's possible that can, you can do something. The transformative power of classical yeah. architecture. Not If you see just a new classical building and it's very good, mm -hmm. then it matters less than if yeah. you see like how it can transform yeah. how our city looks. You exactly. see like an, yeah. an old ugly it's building really then how it was transformed. Mm. Yeah. Because when you see a beautiful classical building, you like it, but how do you take it a little for granted? So yeah. you must really see, you know, this is because if you see a before mm. picture of an ugly building, you can imagine, yes, this is what the place maybe the where I live, yeah. what it mm. looks like. Mm. And it yeah. could change to the better because they did it in other places. Yeah. Mm. You, you see really what it does with, with the city, like mm. uh, with the place. Like there's something mm. about places with nice architecture that you, it's, it's hard to kind of uh, capture. It, it, it's like a feeling you get in a certain place. Mm. Uh, and that is something that's also fascinating because it's very hard to put into words. Mm. Um, just this mental effect, this transcendent effect of, of a beautiful place uh, that you can achieve, I think, also with, with just beautiful architecture. But so that's the first step to, to uh, show to, uh, for people to get involved, to just see this. And then perhaps they can, the second step would be to interact with these channels, to follow them, give a like or search for something else on Google. That's like how they, uh, how you then get a bit more active in that. Um, Even while you might not still be convinced, but exactly, yeah, just the, it's the, when the interesting is peaked or just. Uh, I mean, it's often like how also now algorithms work with like what kind of content is shown to you. If you mm. even watch something longer, then the algorithm knows. Oh, you're interested in this, so it shows more. Mm. Um, but then uh, I think yeah, there's there's more layers. Uh, which which people can go through if, if you uh, yeah first you you see it then you perhaps like it mm. then um, uh, you might actually uh, yeah start to um, uh, yeah start to make yeah that is maybe a you start to question further. the established truths because yeah. in our minds yeah. it's impossible you know ma majority of people have been conditioned that it's not possible to be mm. classical today it's mm. not possible to be the traditional and if yeah. it's possible we shouldn't mm. and then you see it it was done mm. oh yeah. it's kind of nice why can't i do it mm. so yeah. the second after you know the new yorker and berlin mm. the second thing that you do especially now that when yeah. the group is international you publish examples for different countries because every country has one that they look up yeah. to mm. so i noticed that british people love the netherlands mm. <laughs> so yeah. if you post something if i post something on twitter from the netherlands it's like <laughs> one million people in the united kingdom will just praise it how, how much yeah. they like it and if they couldn't do it in the netherlands we should be able to do it in the uk and if I post something from Germany, then Poles will look at it, see yeah. how they are more advanced and we are so primitive, we can't build this beautiful. So, so it's like this, yeah. uh, if they can do it, we must be able to do it as well. Yeah. And why can't we do it? And then they will ask, you know, the architects yeah. and they will come with explanations that are not satisfactory. Yeah. Yeah. And then you start this resentment and rebellion yeah. because but people realize that yeah. they've been fooled all the time. But when will people come to the point where they start asking these questions? So like, when do they get invested enough? Uh, so I think when they have seen enough of this, then they might start to react to these images. Mm -hmm. They might start to share it with friends. Mm. And then you might get to the next point where they get some of them. Of course, mm. it's like a smaller portion. They mm. will start to look if they can do something themselves. They can help in some way. But most people will just look at these accounts or look at these pictures. And, and then you have uh, the, the people um, who actually start making these things. Some people might think, well, I can, I like making things, I can mm. design something, mm. uh, or I can make a video about it, mm. or I can make a, a post. Mm. Uh, and 
uh, that's really where I think the magic happens because then you get new platforms, then you get new mm -hmm. uprisings, mm -hmm. then you get uh, people creatively cooperating mm -hmm. to, to yeah. show these images. Yeah. But the slacktivists are uh, very important <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and I encourage yeah. everyone to be a slacktivist. I'm a slacktivist <laughs> in many ways as well because yeah. they give encouragement. Yeah. Mm. If we post, yeah. we, we had this, this uh, Swedish guy called Edgar and he's 14 years old, no, he's 15 years old now, mm -hmm. and he's the most, you know, self-taught classicist. He draws fantastic classical buildings. Mm. So yeah. what did we do? We published his work in the up uprising. Mm. It's like a flood of love, mm. like yeah. thousands of likes, like, You're, please save us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, this yeah. is encouragement. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we find the new people, but they also, they see this because if you if they are interested in architecture and everyone else is interested in architecture just say that you can't do this in your and then they see what public reaction is to what they do yeah, yeah that that's encouragement you exactly. know because yeah. everyone we are still social creatures we, mm. we want to belong and we want to be accepted yeah. that's very uh, important yeah. yeah because a lot of these people never find their people and, yeah. then, and then suddenly they find their people and yeah. then they find other people who think alike and then often they become friends mm. really good friends because mm. if you have uh, the same values mm. um, or you also are creative and uh, you know that or yeah mm. just, that is uh, a magic formula for just friendship and mm. uh, that's very important but that's very what 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 I also had when I started uh, yeah the aesthetic city I found other people mm. <laughs> and mm. also you see how many people actually agree and then you think well this there's there's actually value in this idea I'm not the only one mm. Mm. it's even the majority yeah mm. Uh, an overwhelming majority th mm. that want this, but they are also they don't have majority of people don't have architecture as a main interest. Mm. So that is totally fine. Yeah. Uh, because I don't have interest maybe in this or that or that. You know, everyone has their you know a special interest in that what we focus on see. But everyone consumes architecture. So if you make it easy for them to see, you know, how the, your built environment could look like and why you like it, they will want more of it. And they will give, you know, enough attention to it. And they will talk. Mm. They will talk with other people. They will talk with people that they know. You will get like a, a buzz in society yeah. of people yeah. talking about it. And when someone, and uh, this is quite fun, I mentioned it often, but it should be a social stigma to be a modernist architect. <laughs> no, because what, you, you have such much power over the built environment and you really ruin it. So if you come to a party, and you say, oh, I, I'm a modernist architect, or I'm an architect, they will just say, you know. Mm. Oh, and then I want people to sneeze. Oh, you're one that design ugly boxes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's really like a, a social cost mm. of, of uglifying. That's our, you know, resistance, you know, mm. because they have the power. So they put all these horrible, ugly buildings everywhere. So at least we have to can show them that we don't like what they mm. do. They can do it because they have the power. But at least we can show that we don't like them because they genuinely believe that they what they do are loved. Many still do. And then again, architects are very, you know, a lot of them are are, are flexible when it comes to, you know, getting work. So I mm -hmm. think also that you need the same kind of dynamic mm -hmm. for developers and for uh, people who build and uh, people who invest and, and uh, have, you know, the big housing uh, yeah. companies and, and organizations as well. So you need you need to make yeah. those demands not just from the architects, but from around. I never blame the, I never blame the construction companies because they are the same as they've always been. Okay. Uh, I don't think that I'm an architect, so I'm more. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I will explain why. I will explain why. Yeah, please Be do. Because let's say a hundred years ago, I don't think they were altruistic construction companies then or builders then. Like, do you I think they're not. like Victorians? Oh, let's cram in one more working class family in these <laughs> tight, uh, <laughs> bad conditions. You know, so. But it was the culture, you couldn't get away building ugly buildings. Mm. Okay, all architects were classic and they did regulate certain things in those times as well. They regulated building height and streets and plot size. So they had a lot of good relation and made the courtyards larger to get in more air and, and, and uh, yeah, fresh air in, into the buildings. Uh, so the developers didn't change. They, may, they shouldn't change. They don't have, they don't care about architecture. 
they are not ideologically motivated. They care about profit maximizing, mm. like they always did. Mm. I have no problem with that at all. Mm. It's like a force. Mm. The force can be directed at good and bad. Mm. They operate in the culture. And what modernists did when they took over architecture schools, they made everything, they made the concept of beauty relative. And if you're a greedy developer, like always in history, that fits, you know, like a, like a hand in a glove. Yeah, oh, that's I can, the danger I can, of it, yeah, of course. Yeah, I can build anything. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. just, uh, beauty is just in the high beholder. Oh, architecture, you know, when you see these ugly new developments in Stockholm and people criticize this, oh, architecture has always created strong feelings and we are happy that we can be a part of that conversation. They can get away with all this nonsense because no architect will stand up and say, there is objective beauty. Mm. They all architects will just say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and I can tell if this concrete ha uh, flag tower is more beautiful than this royal palace. I suppose architecture mm. has become so much mm. more conceptual as well, mm. so that it's not because beauty mm. has always been, you know, it's mm. always been difficult to capture, mm. uh, especially like in the 18th century, people were mm. writing a lot and they mm. thought they were like reaching a conclusion about what mm. was beautiful. And then, you know, a generation later, people were simply disinterested mm. uh, uh, in, in those like very static definitions mm. of beauty. Um, so, uh, so I, I, yeah. I completely agree that, that those things were, um, I don't know, they were, they were sort of ripe for picking uh, mm. and, and, the, uh, and it, was, uh, it was a vulnerable time for, for mm. the concept of beauty. Mm. Also because of, you know, societal changes, uh, changes in, uh, in moral, um, changes in uh, economy, of course, mm. like uh, yeah. uh, you have an expanding economical sector, uh, things that were formerly in part yeah. of family mm. life were suddenly becoming part of economic life. And then, you know, my, my uh, analysis is that fossil fuels also is really tightly connected with this because um, Entropy, like the, the, the way that uh, buildings mm. all over the world mm. look more and more similar, I think is very much connected to the fact that you can literally, uh, uh, you can literally ship materials all over the world with very mm. little cost. And mm. that is something that's connected to cheap fossil fuels. Mm. And you know, the flow of energy, the flow of materials, the flow of information, all mm. these things, um, they, they are very much like non-local. And, and I personally believe that that if you, uh, and th that's some, some of the, the, uh, the power or the uh, almost explosive power of, of using uh, fossil fuels and, and cheap uh, transportation. Yeah. That, uh, so that's one of the reasons why I'm becoming more optimistic about these things is that we're changing away from it. But uh, then uh, we have to yeah. sort of grab that moment. Mm -hmm. They are making it easier, but the, I don't think they're still they're not. It's the culture that is, that is the root root cause, mm. because we could have a very connected world with very cheap materials and still have local variation. All that is Maybe. needed is for we have a classical tradition dominating it then at every architecture school in the world, mm. and then you know developers will fit. If that's the culture, they will build, you know, with towers and, and uh, neo-Renaissance or whatever, and they will make a huge profit of yeah. it anyway. Yeah, uh, could happen, so, I guess. So, yeah, so, so it's, it's, how to say, if you change the architect schools, then you'll change the whole discourse, what is architecture yeah. of our time. And you will, in the magazines, everywhere, the, how, the, how the, the culture is perceived, what is architecture, will mm. change. And then the developers mm. will change. And I'm very positive that they will find methods of automatic, uh, how to say, make this as cheap as possible, but still as high quality as possible. That's the driving force, you know. So, so that's such an interesting theme, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, like, because that's, that's one of the things uh, we've been talking about before, and I guess could use a little bit of elaboration, yeah. is the argument of an economy, mm. right? Mm. Is it more expensive to build uh, a classical building than a non-classical building and in what way and you know how do you measure these things uh, I can you know my considerations is that it it's partly about um, whether you want a single-use building right mm -hmm. do you want a building that <clears throat> is uh, discarded after 20 mm -hmm. or 30 years it will need like complete renovation mm -hmm. or perhaps even just being torn down um, I guess like, sort of like the futurist movement in Italy, for example, mm. they said that each generation should build their own city. 
and then you knock it down. You start from mm -hmm. from uh, from zero again. Um, and of course, I think that's very irresponsible in terms of again, my background is from you know as an environmental activist. Mm -hmm. That's one of my roads into mm -hmm. into this. Um, so it's very irresponsible at that level. But it's also like a cultural catastrophe, of course. Yeah. Uh, and I mm -hmm. think it leads to a way of thinking about buildings. Uh, I see this in the field, like there's so much cardboard, so much glue, so much foam. There's like all these like uh, you lose spongy buildings. Yeah. Yeah, they're not made to stand and not made to last. And of course, it's, it's like the Happy Meal of, of, of architecture. Um, but in, in, so in that regard, it is cheaper. But, um, but I guess there's other answers as well to these questions of, of mm. is it more expensive to build Cascal? I'd like to hear what both of you think about it. Yeah. Um, well, it depends, of course, on uh, so many contextual factors, like mm. uh, in which country you're going to build, uh, what the labor costs are, what uh, if you have clo uh, materials close by. Mm. Uh, for example, like uh, in Jordan, there's an architect who, uh, uh, who builds with stone. He literally finds on the side of the mountain. Mm. And uh, he has just this whole crew of people who are working the stone into beautiful Arabic designs. So there he doesn't have any material cost because he literally just picks it up with uh, puts in a truck, drives to the building site or even closer by and builds his, his, uh, his buildings out of it. But in, uh, I think, yeah, if you're going to build with concrete and then have cladding, um, then you can also do it in, the ne in, well, in, in Western countries. I mean, mm. Poundbury is a good example. I mean, they have uh, nice details here and there. Um, but yeah, it's of course not all made of like natural rock uh, like it used to be and mm. uh, or you have like yeah you have like the the, the concrete wall the, with like masonry in front uh, so yeah uh, it depends a bit on the technology but I think um, what you really uh, prevent from doing especially for bigger public buildings if you build classical mm. often it's the public buildings like museums that use all these very special uh, structural elements like uh, cantilevers, mm. etc. And those are uh, often very expensive to engineer. And then you get all these uh, custom solutions. Mm. So that might make it more expensive than, for example, like, uh, yeah, you can, you can save on that and then put that in ornament, for example. Mm. But for housing, it's, of course, there's way more uh, or way less money available to make it nice, except if you have, like, if it's like an upmarket home. Mm. But I mean, it is still possible in Le Plaisir Benzon. You have it's it's a little bit kitschy, but it is still uh, outside Paris, right? Outside Paris, yeah. yeah it's a small uh, town where they built. Uh, yeah, well, you could say classical-ish. Mm. Um, but it looks French, I'd say. It looks French. <laughs> it's French French buildings, <laughs> and but the social housing you can't distinguish from the from the houses that are for sale. So yeah. the rental and the home owned. Mm. Uh, owned homes are um, are indistinguishable mm. from the outside at least so it is possible um, but yeah if you really want to get quality but the point is also like how much do you want to invest in a building to make it uh, yeah sustainable for the future and also mm. like what is the skin in the game for the for the person building it like a mm. developer is often he builds it he leaves mm. but if you have an investor who builds it keeps it and mm. rents it out or mm. it's his property or who has property surrounding it uh, and he wants to profit off the, the increasing prices of the land, mm. then this investor might be more inclined to put more uh, money into it and to make it beautiful because then the, the land value might increase. There's a lot of studies showing this effect. And then his other property might also increase in value. So he profits from it. So he has skin in the game. Mm. Mm. So I think in that way, I'm thinking of it myself. But mm. material-wise, I mean... It's also how the whole construction business is uh, designed nowadays. It's not designed for ornament. It's mm. not designed for building beautiful, uh, detailed buildings anymore. Mm. Uh, it's, all, it's all kind of constructed around modernist architecture. So if you have companies that are uh, able to make these casts of, of columns or have uh, machines to really quickly produce nice elements, then you can perhaps make enormously detailed buildings way cheaper because mm. we're specialized for it. Yeah, yeah that's mm. true. So, yeah. Mm. You were talking about uh, automation. I, I saw this quite recently in uh, the uh, ILA complex in Oslo, mm. which is, was this partly inspired by the Spanish steps in mm. Rome. 
and they have these uh, balusters, uh, mm. like little columns holding up the uh, handrails, and it's all stone. Mm. And uh, I think the stone must be like a little bit brittle because some of them have been replaced. Mm. And then I could see that they have been like facing a dilemma because they could have afforded either to use the same mm. stone, but then uh, you won't afford to have it like hand mm. cut, right? Mm. Or mm. that you could have something that's hand cut, but then you would use it, you know, imported China, mm. Chinese granite or mm. something. And they went with the first option. So it's really fascinating. So, so these balusters that have been replaced, mm. they work really well within the context because it's the exact same stone. I don't mm. know where it came from, but it looks really good. Mm. And then when you get really close, you can see like the little traces of the CNC machine. Yeah. So it's yeah. been automated, but it works so well within context and it's such a value mm. for the for that place to have the actual same stone instead of like you know Chinese, yeah. Chinese granite can look w wonderful but but for that context I think mm. and it was so fascinating to see it in real life that you could literally do this and then mm. make a, a very ordinary yeah. um, a very ordinary apartment complex afford mm. this yeah uh, the thing is that 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 topic uh, I was in the beginning I was very much for you know automatization and laser mm -hmm. cut but then uh, I, I switch completely because I think it's so important that we do things with our hands and we not lose connection or alienated uh, the, com the building is made in computer and then a laser cuts everything mm -hmm. you know out we need to touch it the imperfection there is both perfection and imperfection in the human hand uh, I think of, of because that's that relative to, to what uh, I experienced recently uh, tombstones mm. you know modern tombstones are laser cut and so perfect they are so sterile mm. they are so lifeless and then you compare into the old tombstones that were more like hand cut uh, hand cut they, you know they are perfect but the surface is not as perfect as it was like laser cut and it's yeah. like completely different feeling uh, of but, the material but isn't the material very important then because I would say, like, if you have but how you cut, how they cut the material. If you cut it with, you know, yeah, but also what it's made from. Like, is it made mm. from concrete or some modern material, mm. like some some uh, metal with a, a zero uh, mm. a zero variation in it or something? But if you make it from, let's say again, this uh, in the Ela complex, it's made from basalt, I think. So there's mm. like there's a lot of like movement in the stone itself, mm -hmm. and then there's the wear of tear of of rain and frost and sun mm. and uh, snow and. So, and some materials age better than others. So I, I guess it depends a bit on which materials you're using, because I completely agree with, the, you know, the beauty of, of using the human hand. Some people will use a combination where you mm. do like most of the work with CNC and then you hand finish it, yeah. mm. uh, which, which can help. But also, if, if you, it depends a lot on which materials you use, mm. I think, uh, because so, some materials mm -hmm. age very different from others. And then that will also give it some personality. Mm. Like the, um, and with plaster and ornament, like personal details, you know, they are perfect, but then when you look closely, they are more individual, each ornament, you know, mm. the plaster ornament. It's so important that we keep this connection, that we are not alienated, that buildings are not reduced to yeah. mere style or consumption, that, mm. that, you know, we are interacting with the buildings, really. Mm. Uh, but, but that's... Yeah, that, that's a, a deeper topic here, but mm. uh, but I think it's very important that uh, I I was, but now I'm not. Now I'm very much for reviving the craft. And regarding costs, I would say no twice. Okay, it's not more expensive to mm -hmm. get classical. And uh, why I say no twice is because there are two different market segments. If we begin with the let's say upper middle class and luxury segment. Uh, we can compare it to jeans. Uh, AGMM jeans, let's say that they cost 200 crowns mm. and they cost 20 crowns to sue. Mm. Uh, Dolce Gabbana jeans cost 2000 crowns and maybe they cost uh, 300 crowns to sue. Mm. So profit maximizing can be making something more expensive because you can sell it for even more expensive. Mm. And that, that is not a theory, that's a fact. Uh, if you have, especially considering, you know, it depends on different, on, on the housing market, but if you have Berlin, the real estate luxury developments that Ralf Schmidt uh, built there, they are like the most profitable ever sold in the city. Oh, really? Yeah. That, who, who built, sorry? Uh, he, the developer is Ralf Schmitz. Okay. And he built like his project called Eisensan One mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. most expensive, you know, the apartment mm -hmm. sold for most okay. in the entire city. And it's classical stuff. Yeah, classical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's another classical architect called uh, 
Mark Kocher. Mm. He built something called Palais Collebelle. Also a new apartment building. It sold 30% more mm. than surrounding buildings yeah, around I've it. Seen some of those yeah. yeah. And 30% more, it didn't cost 30% more to build this no. one. Okay. So yeah. profit maximizing can be, you know, putting a little more effic, mm. just like with every other product, mm. like with shoes, yeah. jeans, clothes, music, mm. you put a little more effort to it and then you can sell it for much, much, much more. Mm. So towards the lux- upper middle class and luxury segments, it's clearly no. Mm. Profit maximizing is always. Mm. Toward the middle class and working class, it's a little b- bit more complicated. It depends if they have choice, you know, housing market, if we take the housing market especially, it, it's not that flexible. If there is mm. a choice, if there is a housing abundance, then you get good architecture because then the, arch- the developers can't sell anything, mm. so then they have to make an effort. Mm. Uh, but it's not more expensive to build beautiful for them either mm. because one mistake that many, many do is that they equate the beauty of classical architecture with the ornaments. Mm. That, oh, it's the marble, it's the angels that make it beautiful. No. It is not. It's the facade division and proportions yeah. and the scale. That is what makes mm. it. You can have a completely mm. naked classical facade, like you had. Mm. Uh, in, um, in Berlin, we have them in Stockholm, and you probably have them in Oslo. They began as Mite Kaserne, you know, rental barracks. Um, that was the <laughs> name given to them, <laughs> you know, in the 1900s, because they were considered ugly, mm. because what they are is classical buildings with no ornament. Mm. They're just, you know, mm. There's plaster, but there's no detail or fonster, feder- uh, what do you call it, uh, fodder around the windows, yeah. nothing detail. You have a ba- clear baseline, and you have a top line, and you have the part symmetries, uh, and the base floor is made of stone usually, mm, mm. and then you have plaster yeah. you know, upwards. Very beautiful buildings, mm. but ornaments. Mm. It doesn't cost a dime more to mm. play, you know, create the classical facade division, no. and then yeah. you get a beautiful building. Yeah. yeah. You can literally just paint the, the, the what is it? The, um, oh, you can have decoration. Yeah. The, 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 more, the yeah. more budget you can, because I think the facade is a very, very little cost of the overall yeah. building. So mm. depending on the segment, yeah. you can make a more simple building mm. yeah. and have it, you know, simple, by the way, with ornamentation, yeah. decoration, and but the division, yeah. everything. Mm. Also to just accentuate the windows uh, and the corners mm. and, the, and the doors. Mm. Uh, yeah, with one different stone, for example, one different brick, uh, that's mm. that's easy, um, mm. and it doesn't have to be that much. And just have, using a different profile, one with a with a bit mm. more form than just mm. a tight one, yeah. uh, can make a huge difference and make it way more uh, give way get get way more structure in the and in, in detail in the facade, or just mm. have something like a, a, yeah above the door like a little. Uh, mm. I don't know what the word is like a little roof above it with a lamp, mm. you know, mm. those. Simple things. I mean, sometimes they're built out of glass and steel, mm. but you can also make them out of wood or something else. Mm. It's just, uh, yeah, it's. You have a style that is perfect, really, in, in uh, Scandinavia, Nordic classicism. Mm. Uh, oh, in Sweden, it's Swedish grace. <laughs> um, that they are very simplistic, yeah. new neoclassical buildings, almost no ornament. Mm. Yeah. Just very, very beautiful, you know, strong. Uh, pastel colors mm. that's perfect in our very dark climate mm. and you have the classical facade division of course and then you have a few strategically placed yeah. uh, stylistic elements on the facade mm. very mm. effectful and very beautiful yeah. Yeah. and no it's i i can't imagine yeah. because the buildings are also usually very square mm. yeah. <laughs> really square it's you know it's, mm, yeah. yeah it's really boxed no uh, very not many have uh, uh, bay how what you call them bay windows and such yeah. it, it, it's really yeah. boxes but they're very beautiful boxes because they divided the facade in the mm. classical way mm. yeah and i uh, think uh, i was thinking about earlier when you talk about uh ribbon uh, building in modern materials and you can still uh, achieve some of these things i'm and again that might be because i'm an architect i love natural mm. materials and i think natural materials yeah. really can contribute towards that you know the the fingerprint mm. of something that's natural and 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 beautiful yeah. and mm. and that speaks to us um but also, like w- when you do that, uh, like they do in Pambury, just just such a simple de- detail as having a proper roof and having mm. the roof overhang the facade yeah. a bit will save that facade from so much wear and tear. Yeah. 
Uh, so just yeah. in that you can save so much money, mm -hmm. and then perhaps you can afford to have like proper a proper slate roof, for example, because you won't have to uh, you, you won't have to redo the roof in twenty years when uh, when it's been broken down mm -hmm. by yeah. by the sunlight, or or you won't have to reclad the facade because the facade's yeah. been protected by the roof. That, that's an excellent point. And Erik Norin, mm -hmm. what, that was guest of Cave of Pels, had a, such an example from here in Norway. Mm. It was on Bergen that all the old vernacular buildings. The facade tips, um, how do you say it? It tips a bit yeah. inward. Mm. Mm. So all the rain damages, you know, the rain goes down. So it damages just the, how to say, the inner at the bottom floor, yeah. the wood there. Yeah. But it doesn't damage, you know, the upper floor. So you know, mm. the, when you change, you know, uh, the wood and the facade, it's, mm. it's just in the lower section. You yeah, know, you don't you have to reclaim the whole thing. The, the yeah. whole thing. And with all the new buildings, they're just flat. Mm. So then you, have, yeah. you get mold and, and damage on mm. the entire facade. Mm. So mm. It's funny, in Netherlands they just lean forward so they could mm. easily uh, like uh, hoist stuff mm. inside with the, with the crane. So mm. it's uh, another way. But then you have, yeah, perhaps a different solution. But I think also another problem is is the materials themselves. Yeah. Uh, so they use uh, the, the wood nowadays. They use a lot more like softer wood. Mm, I guess. Like like all the European hardwood has mostly disappeared because I mean they used extremely hard, great quality oaks when they still had a massive supply of that. Mm. And now they need to use fast growing woods which are much less dense, much less strong. Mm. And uh, so that's also nowadays if you have like a old window made of this really great quality old mm. wood, that's something very precious. And nowadays mm. just, that's also in Palmbury I heard problems, they used this soft wood here and there and mm. it just started mm. rotting really quickly. Yeah. Which is not the same. It's, yeah. um, Maybe bamboo is an alternative. Because now with, you know, with this situation in Russia, uh, you can't buy a floor in Sweden <laughs> because oh, all, okay. all the wood from all all floors where apparently all the wood came from Russia. Oh, okay. oh yes, wow. not even know. not even grown in. Because you in, have trees in Sweden. Yeah, we, we do uh, quite a lot. I've seen them. <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah. But yeah. The, uh, apparently we don't make we make toilet paper of them. We don't make uh, <laughs> floors. So 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 Incredible. you yeah. can't buy a floor now in Sweden. Not no no oak floor, no anything. Uh, insane. So then they showed, you know, but they have bamboo floors now. <laughs> bamboo. bamboo. Yeah. Uh, and I don't say mm. that it's a solution. I know too no, little well, I mean, you know, about floor, yeah. but, but it seems like a hard material. Mm. It looked quite nice when, mm. when, you know, they polished it. I don't know too much about it qualities. I never walked on a bamboo floor, what I know of. Mm. So, but it should be investigated. It looked nice, you know, the, the example. I've seen it. Uh, yeah, I've walked I, on a bamboo floor. So yeah. They're quite pleasant. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you can, they are easy to shift color on, you know, with a uh, with, uh, yeah. uh, lack, what, what do you call it in English? Um, like a stain or varnish? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can make them in different colors. Mm. And bamboo grows very fast. Yeah. Very, very fast. So, very, Crisis very, yeah. is always an opportunity, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's it's sad, like that. That's mm. like there's there's so much strain on all our building materials. But one thing that is not used enough, I think, is natural stone. Mm. There mm. is countless of uh, of pits that are just mm. deserted, mm. like uh, old quarries. quarries old quarries. Yeah, yeah mm. they they're not they're not using them anymore because they they have kind of stopped using this natural stone. Mm. And if you want to build climate neutral. Mm. I mean, you only need to transport, you need to cut out the rock, you need to transport it, you need to work it. Mm. But it is still, even with those expenses, I mean, you can also tr put it in an electric truck in a couple of years. Um, you, you, you just save a lot of, uh, mm. of, uh, of yeah, emissions. Mm. And I mean, it's, it's literally rock. You don't have to bake it. You don't mm. have to, uh, uh, like Portland cement, uh, mm. there's, there's no... Not a lot of CO2. But do you need to mm. make... And it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard, it's durable. You can make buildings that last for, for millennia. Yeah, yeah. I don't uh, have engineering backgrounds. I don't know. But do you, do you really need to make new classical buildings, like say massive stone or massive brick? Can't you just do, like they do regular housing, you have the, the core frame mm. is prefabricated modules in mm. concrete, mm. and then you cover it. Uh, you give you get, you get an illusion that it's massive stone that's or, or massive. Yeah, that's all they, do now. Yeah, all they yeah. do now. But is that how? I don't know. I guess a massive brick and massive stone is more yeah. sustainable because then the structure yeah, will last. But can a can a concrete shell, can, can a, how how does that affect lifespan? You know, like the, if the inside is concrete, yeah, inside that's is not concrete. really a problem. That's not really a problem. No, okay. I wouldn't say so because uh, as long as it's protected from like a lot of moisture or, mm. or being yeah. exposed to the elements, 
And then, uh, yeah, so it, it's a very, you know, adaptable material. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the facades are, are more important than... Um, yeah, because most people don't care about the inside yeah. of, the, <laughs> of the wall. <laughs> it's made, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, uh, you can do wonderful things with that. You can do my mm. massive wood, for example, and mm. then you can even use the softwoods because they're quite mm. good yeah. at insulating and they mm. capture a lot of carbon and that stuff. But yeah, I, I've, seen, I've seen a couple of examples. Um, uh, I've seen a couple of examples of, of new buildings where they, you know, the, you build the inner structure first mm. and then you raise a wall on the outside. Mm. And that uh, wall will often, it won't be like a load-bearing wall, mm -hmm. but it can be like, I think it's called like self-bearing or something. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it keeps itself up, mm -hmm. uh, which is like the middle ground. But you could also just use uh, these traditional materials, brick, stone, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, lime plaster. You can use them as cladding, as a skin. And, mm -hmm. and buildings do need skin. Most buildings mm -hmm. do need the skin mm -hmm. to, to keep the yeah. rain and the heat and the mm -hmm. cold out. So that's a perfectly, you know, all, all right solution. And a lot of architecture, including a lot of modern architecture mm. or most modern architecture is, mm. you know, it's to some degree a stage set. It's to some degree like showing one thing and it, there's actually something yeah. else going on yeah. behind it. And that's because it's the same as us wearing clothes. In theory, mm. we don't need to wear clothes, but in many situations it comes in quite practical. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I think it's it's fair for buildings to do that as well, but you can still articulate it in a way that uh, reminds us that gravity is a thing and that things point towards the sky, thing la things land on the yeah. earth, there's arches to keep the g gravity mm. coming down mm. and, and if things stick out, there's something mm. supporting them underneath, th those sort mm. of... Um, and then modernists will keep. come and say that uh, it's not an honest building. Yeah. 99.9% people don't care if it's honest because it, uh, honest or dishonest because it's concrete on the inside. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And their buildings aren't honest either. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, but, but yeah. I mean, it, that's also touching on, how, on the conceptuality of architecture now. That, that, uh, that ideas like it is not honest it is oh it, it's 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 sustainable uh, or does it look sustainable um, <laughs> i mean that's the biggest thing like buildings now they they what i really get frustrated about is these vertical forest towers mm -hmm. uh, like uh, boeri or something like mm -hmm. the, the italian architect mm -hmm. which is like marketed as something super uh, sustainable and amazing but it's just a huge concrete thing mm -hmm. which i don't know how much uh, <laughs> emissions you, you need to to build such a thing mm. and then they put some plants in the in the balconies and they need like special systems to uh, to give it water to uh, maintain it uh, and of course the whole building itself is not flexible it still casts shadow uh, mm. <laughs> surrounding uh, on the surrounding parts it has all the other negative aspects of the of the high rise and unintended and consequences yeah you know we, we talked about balconies on the facade that they are useless people Oh, I want a balcony, but they will never use a balcony as towers or facade. Yeah. Mm. And oh, it's so lovely with this green building. Oh, but if you live in a jungle, you will get a lot of insects on your balcony. So <laughs> when you sit there and eat and have a coffee, they will drop down, you know, bugs and, and yeah. everything and mosquitoes. And I think people yeah. haven't really figured that out. Yeah. Okay, but then the solution is, of course, pesticide. But is it a green building then? <laughs> but it's, it's just also just virtue signaling. Yeah. It's, it's, mm. it's, 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 not, it's not an actual solution to an mm. actual problem. I mean, massively uh, embracing uh, well let's say bamboo and natural stone in the construction mm. industry that is going to really save emissions mm. not having a couple of trees on the tower which might suck some co2 which you can also have in a park somewhere yeah and, and li long longevity of a building yeah. if you make a building beautiful yeah. and rich in cultural expression we will find a new purpose for it when yeah. the original function yeah. is not there yeah. so yeah. we I, I take you know what's closer to home stockholm old mill yeah. buildings mm. Or yeah. luxury hotels now. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Old factories in the Netherlands. Mm. We have the, the, mm. the, what is it? The Westergasfabriek, which yeah. was a huge gas factory where they made gas for the lamps of the city. Mm. And now it is like a creative hub. You have restaurants. It's like one of the most mm. favorite places. There's mm. a park around it. Mm. Uh, the, the, all the houses surrounding mm. the Wester Park uh, area, mm. which was just like an old factory made with old brick, mm. are worth so much more because, well, first they have, of course, the park, but also mm. just the, this place with all these uh, amenities. Mm. So, uh, yeah, building buildings that are flexible and just beautiful. 
Yeah, that when is, you compare that to the yeah. Green Tower, which like the day the water system stops and no one's willing yeah. to uh, all the batteries on yeah. a yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I yeah. think it's. I, I have to say, I think those sort of projects are really well intentioned. I'm sure yes, that architect course. really loves trees, and I love trees, so I can really mm. understand it. Everybody I, loves trees. Yeah, <laughs> so but he, he couldn't think like always in modern. They never think, you know, unintended consequence or next step. It, it's like. Have because we're so lived? used to getting free or, or cheap resources in, right? Yes. Remodeling a building has been very cheap, very mm. easy yeah. uh, for uh, at least 150 yeah. years now. Just and tear that's, it down. Yeah, just tear it down and build something new. And uh, what's important mm. is what, what, uh, how it works when it's standing there. But that's, that's not, um, I think that's not the way forward. No. Uh, no, build, a green building is one that is beautiful and rich in culture and expression then we will always find new use for it. Yeah. So we will find new use for the old factory and the old mill yeah. building. Mm -hmm. And in 100 years, maybe it will not be yeah. uh, a luxury hotel, then it will be housing, yeah. then it will be office. It will be like yeah. old classical but buildings have had so many functions during history. But there's also one extra thing that is necessary that is kind of over engineering it. So having uh, wider spans Mm. and higher floors mm. because if you have a higher span you have like bigger rooms you can do mm. more in it you can have more f uh, uses there you can mm. put uh, desks in you can put mm. machinery in mm. anything mm. higher floors means also the same you can you can maybe subdivide it in multiple levels if you want or uh, yeah you have more daylight and it's a more beautiful space mm. so high floors wide spans that's like a recipe success recipe for just having a building that lasts longer mm. 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 absolutely uh, do you think these arguments are, um, you know, do you think they're accessible to people who are outside of our, you know, we're sort of in a bubble of people who care a lot about architecture, um, like returning to to um, to what we were talking about earlier. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I love discussing these yeah. things and. Uh, and I've been, you know, trying to talk to, I find it all, it's always interesting to talk to people who are not, you know, that into architecture, about yeah. architecture. And of course, like 90% of what, what they're saying is like, why can't you build beautiful old buildings like they used to? And I'm, you know, I used to have yeah. these long explanations and now I often just say, you can. There's lots of examples. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Go look it up. But mm. um but um, I'm 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 still like curious. Uh, uh, yeah, like are there are there like some major hindrances uh, for for inviting people in? And let's say especially uh, you were talking about architecture schools, and I guess architecture schools are different as well. Mm. Um, but if we are to convince. Uh, you know the next generation of architects mm. that building uh, building more classical is also more sustainable. That's the kind of architecture that's mm. needed in the world right now. How do we invite them in? That's that's. I, I feel like there's a bit of a dilemma. And I wish everyone had that sort of uh, anthropological. What do you call it? Like uh, engaged uh, <laughs> engaged yeah. observation. There's some mm. term. And, um, but uh, participatory ob observation, I guess, something like that. Um, that everyone just had that curiosity. Um, but but if we're, uh, we're going to be more accessible, if we're going to uh, invite more people in, like, it's, it's something lacking. That's, I must admit, I'm kind of afraid there is. So that's why I'm asking the question. Regarding architects, uh, modernist, modernist architects, it's impossible. Uh, that's mm. the anthropological answer. And I will explain <laughs> very short <laughs> really? why. Yes, okay. and I'll explain shortly why. It's very much like, uh, and I don't want to get in politics, but it's very much like communism. Let's say that you lived entire life in Soviet Union and you wake up in 1990 mm. and they tell you that everything you believed your entire life was a lie. Mm. That's kind of hard to your identity and imagination. Probably you will rather double down than, than, you know, accept that everything you believed in your entire life was a lie. You know, it, as a human, it's, this is very soul-crushing. So it's the same with modernists. Everything I believed in, all these strange shapes, architects, uh, it should look of our time, and, and uh, blah, 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 and, and all these things, it was all a lie. 
how are you gonna how are you gonna you survive to, that? You have to change your way of thinking from yeah. conceptual base so, to. So, so what yeah. you can do, the only thing you can do maybe is like an exit strategy. Like you know, they have exit strategy for Nazis. You know, so you can leave it with yeah, or like with the religious sects. And yeah, that you leave stuff. it with honor. So okay. I didn't really. What's the, what's <laughs> the exit strategy <laughs> for modernist architects then? <laughs> what I tend to, to tell people who are curious about these things, because there mm. are modernist architects mm. who are curious about curious about mm. classical stuff and might mm. want to do that sort of stuff, mm. is I tell them, you have to you have to broaden your perspective, sort of, like, because we are taught in architecture schools that time and honesty uh, mm -hmm. as expressed uh, stylistically connected to time is like the number one criteria for what's good architecture, mm -hmm. is, is that honesty. And then, then I say, you know, Authenticity is a very mm -hmm. interesting concept, and, and you can you can you know of course like deconstruct the whole thing and mm -hmm. say say like uh, a lot of what you do are, isn't that authentic anyway. But you can also talk about authenticity towards a place, or authenticity towards uh, tradition, or to the authenticity towards yeah. crafts. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want there to be like people who know proper bricklaying, if you want there to be people who can do plaster, if you want there to be people who know how to make paint that's not from mm, yeah. plastic, then you have to sort of make the buildings that allow for those things as well. Um, so that's yeah. that's what, what how I try to talk about it in ways so that y you have to broaden your perspective and broaden yeah. uh, your uh, criteria for, for what's quality. They have to change the whole perception of time. Mm. Uh, because in the modernist thinking, the technical pros progress equates this man's, uh, how to say, uh, spiritual progress. Mm. So, yeah. because we are more technologically advanced than people a hundred years ago, we are better humans also. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, that's really yeah. the thinking. So you cannot yeah. look back because you cannot learn anything from those people. I once, I once dated a girl for a short while that uh, went to art school in Stockholm. Mm. And she really, really disliked, you know, Renaissance paintings. Hmm. And I asked her why. Hmm. Because they had such bad values at those times. Hmm. Uh, so yeah. so, so you, that's, you know, the mindset that we cannot learn anything from them because they didn't, they didn't have the same values as we have today. Yeah, it's like the art history argument. Every, yeah. every period has its values and that value is reflected in art and architecture. So that's what makes imitation, you know, immoral or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's because it reflects another time with different values. And I, I find the argument to be simplistic. But of course, saying that, that's, you know, knocking, yeah. Uh, yeah. knocking the whole, yeah. whole uh, you know, uh, science of yeah. art history yeah. so, over because yeah. that's their whole argument. Yeah, so, so instead, so. <laughs> instead yeah. people at schools should see themselves as part of a chain. It's very mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, technology has progressed, but if you lead, read Marcus Aurelius from 2000 years ago and you read his things and his musings and everything, is he so different from a person today? Mm. Are, are there, you know, what, what people write about 2000 years ago and three years ago, love, marriage and happiness, children, teenage, you know, yeah. the ancient Greeks complained about, you know, the, the teens didn't listen to them and, and uh, did. We are the same humans as ever mm. and we face yeah. the same problem. Mm. So our spiritual progress, you know, we, we are not spiritually better than them. Yes, our values are different, but our spirit, you know, what, what our concerns are, are more or less the same. And, so oh, yeah. we should see ourselves as a chain. You are here, there were people before you. And there will be people after you. Mm. We will be dead in a hundred years. Mm -hmm. I pro okay, maybe not. I, I don't know how <laughs> what technology changes, but yeah. uh, we will die sometimes. But there will be people after us, mm. yeah. and there will be people after them, and after them in yeah. a thousand years, everyone that's alive today will be dead. And you have to see that as something beautiful. The connection. Yeah. 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 And also they see progress as some sort of a linear thing mm -hmm. that mm. goes always up or something. I mean, mm. I see it more like a cyclical thing with mm. progress and then decay as well. Yeah. And um, if you look like that, then, and, and also if it is indeed linear, let's, let's mm -hmm. take this assumption, linear towards what? Like what mm. values are they? What are we going towards? What mm. is so much better in the future mm. we're going towards? Mm. Like what is their utopian view? Can they describe it? Like what, mm. what, what does it look like? What, is, it, is it really like um, some sort of a living in Coruscant from, mm. from Star Wars or mm. in Blade Runner? <laughs> exactly. If, if yeah. we look at all the you know, portraits of the future and the cities of the future, okay, it, it's a movie. 
but it portrays the future and our imagination of the future is that the future that we want to live in yeah that depends uh, the uh, naboo uh, in star yeah. wars okay that one I maybe like. that <laughs> <laughs> but that's like a nice local place like it's the empire which is the which is kind of the modernist uh uh, yeah. Uh, uh, even the federation, yeah. you know, yeah. the federation planet, you know, exactly. it, it's, it's all just you know, strange high rises, and everyone, yeah. no one has connection to the ground floor because everyone is yeah. just flying above. But you, know? you <laughs> see that the evil, yeah. the evil guys in the film, they have like this very stark, un unpersonal, uh, ugly square, uh, modern uh, mm. aesthetic as well, and it's everywhere the same. Mm. Um, mm. And but but it's also uh, something about place, mm. place and indigenous culture, like. Is it really so good to replace unique indigenous culture in the form of their architecture, <coughs> local architecture, Sorry. with yeah. ge uh, well, with with generic architecture which is worldwide, which does not have anything to do with that place, mm. and just structurally block by block, <coughs> building by building, replacing um, that with this genericness? Mm. That's mm. like also a way of destroying indigenous. Um, culture yeah is yeah. that really okay with because that is what modernism is doing and yeah the culture yeah. beauty of the world i, yeah. I think when well, you, international school mm -hmm. when you think yeah. about progress you have to have more than uh more than one line in in uh, in that diagram i guess uh, uh i think martin luther king said the arc of history bends towards justice and that's a beautiful thought but that's just the line of justice, let's say. Yeah. And, and again, you know, uh, for me, uh, being a gay man, I'm very happy about, you know, gay marriage being legal or even being gay being legal. Like, that's, that's a great thing. But I can still feel very sad about, you know, there's half as many wild animals in the world now mm. as there were when I was born. Mm. The, uh, we live, and, or, and there's, you know, there's been, we've, we've had these decades yeah. and decades of energy use, of yeah. uh, progress, of uh, riches, and we spent it making mostly, again, foam yeah. and glue and cardboard Plastic and soup. very little of, yeah, yeah and, very and, little of value. And, and if you take the story of, of homosexuality and the acceptance of homosexuality, it's not linear through history. No, that's true. Uh, yeah. so, so it... Uh, Greeks and Romans had their view on homosexuality. Yeah. Uh, for Greeks, it was very much accepted. Romans had no problems with it. Uh, funny anecdote, that the ones that took it were not allowed to vote. But, mm. <laughs> but, 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 but they had no problem with it. Yeah. Then there was a dip, and now we're back again. So, so it's yeah. not line. history is not like liner, you know. And the same thing, you know, that this... The, this uh, thinker, this uh, Fukuyama or something, he wrote the end of history now, that mm. everyone would become liberal democracy in the 90s. Mm. Well, if you look at the world, is, is, yeah. <laughs> is everyone liberal democratic? <laughs> no, <today>? it's <laughs> no. The, end of, <laughs> the end of history. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so I, I think the, the, yeah, the, the uh, artistic uh, or the art history you know, story about yeah everything being bad before and everything being great now it's it's too simple at least yeah you have to you have to introduce more lines into the diagram and see that some of them go up and some of them go down mm -hmm. and that the world will keep yeah as you said like you you have this ten things will keep keep changing yeah though it's not the the easiest thing to to um I think to explain to people who who are getting into this stuff, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, just, just have respect because for, for people that lived before you, mm. uh, because we will all uh, tell them that you will all be old one day. Mm. Do you want everything <laughs> that you held dear yeah. being valid? Mm. I grew up in the eighties and nineties. You grew up in the nineties. Nineties, two thousands. Two thousands. Yeah. So that we want all that thrown on the dustbin because it was past. Mm. We, we probably didn't have the same nice values then that we have today, you know, compared with. Yeah. Uh, I, I spoke about, a, um, like when we had dinner, just about a, a Norwegian magazine called Python. Mm. It's, to <laughs> it's totally horrific. <laughs> it shouldn't be printed today, <laughs> but we, it was, it's extremely hilarious. Mm. Should everything from the 90s be banned? Uh, were we culturally mm. backward then in the 90s because we had Python, yeah. you know? So, so yeah, uh, it's, it's single-use uh, thinking. Yeah, and we can't have that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. we can't just like make new things, throw away the old, yeah. make even larger garbage piles 
if we're talking about culture, if we're talking about buildings, if we're to talking about art, uh, yeah. I, th I think we have to realize that everything we do comes from somewhere and it's going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And when you do that, then... Uh, you should be... Uh, the word conservative is very confused with reactionary today mm. in, in speech. But you should have a conservative mindset. Mm. That is, you keep what is good and you reject what is yeah. bad from it's the old. And so, you, so, you, so you always progress, you know, you take the new that is good mm. and reject the bad and so you continue history so you mm. always keep the good things and reject the bad things mm. yeah that's how most people do in their personal lives yeah but you also need to give things a second chance i think in the there were times when some of the beautiful old neighborhoods were so derelict that they didn't see the value in them anymore because they, were, they didn't care for them well mm. and now when now all these historical areas have been renovated we see the value in, in them again and we see how, yeah, like it's beauty, it's form beauty shines again. So mm -hmm. that's also a thing that is sometimes forgotten, I feel like the, the re-evaluation of these places which now look deteriorated. Um, but um, yeah, uh, if you, yeah, renovation and, and just giving, uh, yeah, giving things a second chance. Uh, uh, also like older, yeah, you need, we need to <laughs> look at everything that, that has value and we see beauty in, mm. but um, yeah. Even modernist buildings. I, I personally yeah, think that... <laughs> no, but I, th I think that's like speaking of facades, that mm. most modernist buildings should just be reclad. And they should get like a, pr like proper, a proper roof and some beautiful, uh, nice facades with real walls. And then, of course, there's problems. There's problems with, you know, low ceilings and there's problems with the quality of things inside. Sometimes you have to completely renovate it or, or, or move it or pull it down. Or, yeah, they can, yeah. They can have a problematic scale, but at least you can keep part of it, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, because it's not going away. If you tear down the modernist building and put something else there that's mm -hmm. much nicer, that material, that's, that's still yeah. going somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's not yeah. gone, even if you just uh, remove it and, and say... Yeah. The problem um, is that mm. we can get very strange classical, because modernism is the majority of the built environment, mm. we will get very strange classicism if we only have like reclad modernist buildings. And, <laughs> and, <sometimes, laughs> yeah. and, and the urban yeah. fabric sometimes doesn't work. That's the biggest problem with mm. a lot yeah. of these modernist buildings. It's not necessarily sometimes, yeah, well, the building often creates the urban fabric around it, and that's sometimes mm. a big problem. And if you want to have a nice street, for example, and you mm. just have this block in a park, Mm. then it will not be a nice, yeah, like it, it will no. not be a nice neighborhood. <laughs> but then you have a lot of space to build a nice street next to exactly. it. Exactly. And yeah. then like the, uh, the, uh, the effect of that, uh, you know, yeah. ugly tower. And then you recloud the tower yeah. in with like beautiful neo-renaissance, whatever. Yeah. Uh, or maybe cut down yeah. because I, I don't believe that people should live in towers. I think mm. the maximum is six stories, six or mm. seven stories. Uh, because otherwise we lose connection with the street and what's mm. happening. Mm. If you live on the 12th floor, do you have any yeah. connection with what's happening on, on the bottom floor? You no. can't even see who is, who is no. walking there. It's, mm. uh, if you live on the sixth yeah. floor, you can at least scream at your children to come in and eat. Mm. Uh, <laughs> now you, you'll have yeah. to phone them now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. And also it's safety in the hallways. It's the shadow. It's the light. It's the, there, there's mm. so many problems, uh, but also mental problems even. And uh, yeah, it's just, just, just a community. How do you build a community with when you go in your elevator every day uh, and then, yeah, you go through the hallway to your little apartment. Yeah, no, it's built for privacy. That's the whole idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's built to not have a community, not have people watch you yeah, all the time, so but be able yeah. to like... So it's a community destroyer in yeah. a sense. Mm. So you need a private common space mm. for, for, la for a limited amount of people, the people that live in the building. So yeah, that's why you have the courtyard. Mm. And maybe yeah. you don't are friends with them, but you will see them and you will interact with them because yeah. you use the same common courtyard. It will be the same yeah. people all mm. the time. Yeah. So you get some kind of relationship with them. Mm. Yeah. It can be deep or it can be cordial. And yeah. Maybe you have children the same age. They start play. Maybe you have the same interest and you invite yeah. each other. But it will be a set of people so that you can create yeah. a community, not like an open court and there will come pe new people all the time. Yeah. Mm. Uh, mm. yeah, and closed spaces and also always have like um, at the front of the building facing the street have front doors, little gardens mm. where perhaps people can put a chair, um, make it a mm. bit personal so people mm. can also interact there. But mm. someone sipping the wine in the evening in the sun and then uh, having mm. a conversation with the neighbor who's having a cigarette or mm. something. Mm. That's the type of urbanism that just creates, uh, yeah, human connections. Yeah. yeah. And you yeah. have that in almost all parts of the world and they're destroying it now, mm. thanks to modernism. I think of, of China especially, you know, this old, uh, I pronounce it probably very wrong, 
Hutong, yeah, yeah, Hutong, you know, yeah. their courtyard architecture. Yeah. How interactive it is, you know. <laughs> they sit out and they play backgammon, and they, you know, they, everyone passes yeah. by, <coughs> children runs around, and then you have the courtyard that is a little, little more private. And now they are replaced by 40 story high rises. Mm. Yeah. It's like maybe, you know, one story Hutongs is not feasible for a city of 10 million, but, but yeah limit it to five or six stories yeah. mm. and make you know if you make a good grid you can get proper density but yeah. proper yeah. density is not too much yeah. you know there can be too dense fabrics as well yeah. that, that we don't want people to feel crowded yeah um, and towers often aren't more dense because they they're placed so far apart yeah so mm. so then you can you can just like reorganize it into like proper perimeter blocks instead mm -hmm. in courtyards and then you have the yeah. same number of people yeah. but it just functions because the much more according to human psychology i guess yeah because the courtyard will be used you know you see these towers and you have yeah. the dead red, gray, green space around that yeah. no one, that no one yeah. uses. I, th yeah. I think there were some early modernists who like sincerely believed that grass would you know make you a better person yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> or even like pre-modernists like garden yeah. city uh, planners mm. and stuff yeah. I, I i think i have this from jane jacobs uh, the death and life of the great mm. american city one of the early very important books of course, she wasn't an architect because she was being uh, she was yeah. being impersonal about this. Mm. She was actually going yeah. out and see how things work, and and she made this note that that people, you know, in the late nineteenth century, mm. early twentieth century, it seemed to think that grass would make you a good person. <laughs> it, it was like every it was like a city beautiful because they they had a lot of like you know immigrants from people all around the world, and let's say people like places like United States, even France. Mm. And they want to lift this, you know, ragtags, illiterates from all over different European countries to mm. quickly civilize them and make them, you know, Americans. So, so mm. there was, you know, thoughts about them yeah. and, and some were not wrong. But, but yeah, grass, that's, but the English garden is more like a natural, yeah, uh, yeah how it's natural. Yeah, like English gardening yeah. style, yeah. Yeah, and I can, give it to the, I can give it to early modernism, the interwar early modern, mm. uh, in the Swedish functionalist areas. They, they kept a lot of real mm. nature you know so the courtyards mm. you have a real cliff with a pine tree or yeah pine yeah. tree that's right that. and yeah as a kid that's 10 times more fun to play in <laughs> absolutely uh, than, uh, but you you, call, you you uh you were talking about jane jacobs and what i find interesting is, is that all these things we're talking about mm. now all these mistakes mm. jane jacobs already uh, addresses them really early <sighs> and all yeah. the planners have to read her all the yeah. planners have to read her it's like on the standard book list mm. so it's this it's like this mistake that gets over and over yeah. made over and over mm. and the knowledge that it is a mistake is there mm. it's just oh it's a mistake or we continue doing it they, because they, we cannot look back if we do something exactly yeah. like they did before that we will be we will probably have a lot of prejudice and, and start being evil to people <laughs> yeah you know, it, it's the mindset that really yeah. and and there will be no raining yeah. water and there will be no electricity <laughs> yeah. in the building because so. once you go back once you see like what might be the answer mm. uh, that is traditional urbanism and mm. and accompanied with uh, or new urbanism you could mm. call it but new urbanism is just traditional urbanism is in a new jacket with traditional architecture and mm. uh, but that is not a solution they want to accept no it's what, outside what of solution? the rule sorry oh the the solution of traditional urbanism and architecture together i guess i uh, guess but then that, yeah. that's why you need to be like interested in facts i guess i i don't think you can i don't think you'll ever reach a point where where science has like the exact answer to how to create a good building or a good uh, uh a good uh, neighborhood because you do need the touch of the human hand but i do encourage and whenever i talk about these things i I encourage my colleagues to th look into the science of architectural psychology and looking to, you know, empiricism like uh, Jan and Ingrid Gell who made these studies of how people mm. function in cities uh, because there's so many answers there or even Jane Jacobs. And yeah, again, you know, Jane Jacobs, she, when she writes about homosexuals in The Death and Life of Great mm. American Cities, she called mm. them like parked perverts or something. Uh, <laughs> so like terminology of the day. Yeah. Yeah. So even she has her problems if you want to be like critical in that way. But that doesn't mean yeah. that her observations were wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that, of course, you make analysis through a cultural lens and sometimes you miss the target. But still, you can get so much out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the same thing with, with architecture that uses history the toolbox of history right yeah so many clever things have been thought out throughout the centuries mm. and and 
that's such a freedom that and that's just there's such huge possibilities in, in thinking of it as a as a toolbox and not something that's just to be put on the shelf. And you have maybe you know I I, I changed my mind now during this discussion. Maybe there is a possibility to change modernist, mm. uh, but I don't go through. You are interested in facts. Facts mm. doesn't matter. That's an after thought. There. It's about more identity. Uh -huh. If you can make people understand that is. It's not conser you know, conservative in the political sense to mm. before classical architecture. Mm. It's equally progressive. Mm. We can discuss about different styles. Different styles of classical architecture can have political leanings. Mm. But the whole tradition is, is as progressive as it gets. Yeah. Giving people a humane and beautiful environment. Is that not progressive? <laughs> you know? So, so is, if, if yeah. you can market it as, as the way it is, yeah. it's not. You will not become an old-fashioned, uh, yeah. old-fashioned uh, aristocrat. And, and uh, yeah. uh, how to say? You don't need to sell traditional lifestyle to them. Mm. You can yeah. learn from them, mm. yeah. but it can still be a progressive view to do their things. And this is very Absolutely. important yeah. for the, the getting people so into the architecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's because that is. Um, you need to package it and you need to communicate it in a way that that makes it very clear uh, that it is not some sort of a backward stance. Mm. Just connected to these facts we discussed and connected to this way of portraying it from like, hey, it's, it's actually a very pragmatic way to solve real world problems. Mm. And in that way, it's actually very progressive. And then I think you can actually get people um, to, um, yeah, to, to embrace it. Mm. Mm. And, and lift letters. up, lift yeah. up examples. You know, they, they said, if, if you want to connect it to a progressive world view and, and let's say more tolerant against sexual minorities, Leonardo da Vinci wasn't he? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so lift him. You know, yeah. li lift him. There, there. Are how many classical architects were were not? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like Michelangelo or something. Yeah, and yeah. So there's a lot of uh, yeah, yeah. There's a big tradition there. Yeah. So, so lift them up. Mm. You know, are, are these people were these people horrible or, or prejudiced? Mm. So you can be a progressive in a, in a traditional classical architect, and you can mm. be a conservative and be it. it yeah. It's not. It's not, you know, the tradition itself has no political lean. Mm, it can mm. be used in any direction. And it can contain so much. That's, yeah. that's what I love about yeah. it. Yes, so you can be progressive, you can love environment, uh, you can be tolerant, you can be any political ideology mm. that there is and embrace classical tradition. Mm. And, and that's the exit strategy, I would say. Mm. That they are afraid that they have to become something that they personally don't want mm. to be mm. if they embrace tradition, mm. but they don't. Mm. No, because when you embrace tradition, you make it your own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. I think, uh, I think yeah. that's <laughs> the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, it is beautiful and it is, it, is, uh, it is like the meme I told you about, mm. uh, you know, reject modernity <laughs> yeah. and you have this this portrait of the 50s nuclear family yeah. embrace tradition and then you saw this ancient greek motto of, of men engaging in in uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> what means to being engaged? Uh, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so yeah tradition can be what you want i, I would say but, but um so, so there is something yeah. for everyone yeah and then uh, the yeah. goal is that we should fight in the future what style classical style we want of the building mm. Depending, of, of course, our political yeah. leanings and orientations, but, mm. but, not the whole, but not the whole tradition itself. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I agree. Yeah, not sure if I've got anything to add to that. It's, no? uh, yeah, it's uh, well, yeah, just just I think the, there's maybe one thing about the communication, like how how do we how do we bring this forward? Mm. This point mm. uh, where yeah, where do people find this uh, this message, mm. and how do mm. people find mm. this message? Yeah. And I think there is there's still a big battle to be fought to to make sure that this is clear, mm. <laughs> because it is yeah there's there's a lot of myths around mm. and and it's like uh, one of the things I do most with my platform is just trying to do myth busting mm. Mm. just uh, just about the economics about these uh, yeah also I mean about the political uh, political side also about sustainability. There's a lot of misconceptions and myths and, uh, and fallacies going around, mm. which first need to lose their power because there's a lot of people who have 
these fallacies have been repeated over and over and over again mm. and they're ingrained in people's uh, minds and like mm. it's the first thing i hear from people who don't know a lot about architecture but kind of agree but then you say hey with i i believe we can build like this and then you hear but isn't it too expensive mm. isn't it uh yeah you know but it's but that that building it has it has trees on on the balconies mm. isn't it more sustainable mm. and then well no it's 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 still built of concrete and so you have to repeat all these all these uh deep yeah all the debunking of the myths over mm. and over as well yeah. mm. so that's i think a very big challenge um, yeah. and it needs to be accessible uh and uh, but i think in if those stories uh start seeping out to like more mainstream media mm. like now in in sweden i believe mm. that there's finally like a change of winds mm. uh that might happen yeah mm. yeah i agree yeah, we will see, you know, but I, I'm very optimistic about, about the future of the classical movement, as long as we keep it bipartisan, that everyone mm, is yeah. allowed on the train. Yeah, absolutely. Because what happened now in the US, the classical movement broke in two parts. Mm, yeah, I know. I noticed. Yeah, so, so because of they introduced politics. Mm, yeah. And that's just stupid. You don't need... We agree on classical tradition. We don't need to agree on every other policy issue no. that there is. And it's so re yeah. reductionist yeah. Like, to, uh, to say that uh, architecture is just about one thing. That's, yeah. that's very, I would almost say, naive. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very different from, uh, yeah. from where you, uh, w what the possibilities yeah. are with yeah. the subject, really. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I guess that's, uh, yeah, that's not an invitation. That's a, that's a proper mm. hindrance actually mm. for, yeah. for uh, getting people in but then it's just about opening more doors and showing there's there's mm. so many of the ways of approaching this and then uh, you can't you can't read it just as just one thing mm. uh, if you want yeah. if you want to learn about it if you want to influence it yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but i'm optimistic I, I promise you we will have a, in 30 years we will have a reunion here mm. and then we'll this I scream at each other which classical style is mm. the new parliament building here in Oslo should be. <laughs> we might be wearing Roman togas as well. Yeah. Oh, yes. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then I say, embrace tradition, have the Babylonian toga or something. <laughs> uh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah.